Welcome to the Austin Forum Upload, the podcast of the Austin Forum on technology and society. I'm Jay Boisseau, the founder and executive director of the Austin Forum. And I'm Mary Garza. I am the UX and web designer for the Austin Forum. And Mary and I are very happy to welcome two friends and colleagues to today's episode about design and tech. Welcome Eric Suma, a UX designer for Dell Technologies, and Jennifer Hooley Houlihan, a UX designer for the Flatiron School. Say hello to our audience, guys. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. Hooley, we know really well in multiple ways. She used to work for the Austin Forum as our managing director, and I also know her from the Austin Smart City Alliance and other social impact activities in Austin. And Mary, tell everyone how you know Huli. She was my instructor for UX design. Um, she's the reason why I'm even here right now. So, oh my goodness, yeah. Wow. And I'm super grateful for that as well, Huli, for your mentoring and teaching Mary as a UX designer, and that she now works for the Austin Forum, bringing those skills to our activities. And Eric, longtime friend, great to have you here, and look forward to sharing your insights on design and UX with our listeners. The premise of today's episode is that design and UX in tech are increasingly important since we're increasingly using technologies in everything we do, from working and learning to shopping, entertainment, and more. The pandemic, of course, further accelerated almost everyone's use of technology, including many of us working from home, many people learning from home, lots more shopping from home, and depending on streaming services for entertainment and whatnot. So people are intimately aware of the features and capabilities of many technologies, but are people consciously aware of the design that goes into making these things work and making them easy and more useful, more productive, and even making us happier when using them? And thus are people aware of the role that design plays in tech interfaces they use daily and the effort that designers expend to make that design great. So Mary, I'll start with a couple of easy questions, starting with what the term design means in this context. Hooli and Eric, would you give us your definition of what design is and what UX is and what UX designers do? That's a great question to start with, Jay and Mary. I would say that design, design is how something works. It's not just how it looks. It's how it feels. It's how the pieces operate. It's how it supports a system. It's how a task gets completed. And if you don't design something, then you're leaving it to chance. And you wouldn't do that with anything else in your business. So that's that's why I would say design is so critical, so important. UX design is a subset that focuses on the user rather than the producer of the material or the app or the digital solution. It's about how the user experiences it, not how the CEO may want it to look. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And to to build on that, I think a lot of people have a a lot of confusion about um, the differences between art and design, right? Um, Art is is sometimes intentionally ambiguous, right? And that's that's part of the fun of of looking at like a painting like the Mona Lisa, right? Like why is she smiling? You know, and that's that's part of the the story that you can invent yourself. Um, when it comes to UX design, there's intentionality with what you're designing, right? Where paintings or or art can be ambiguous. Uh, UX design is very intentional. And it exists for a functional reason, right? Um, it's 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 the difference between a personal idea versus a data and research driven uh, type of output, right? Um, and it's very very objective based. And as as Huli said, um, it's really about understanding your users and their intentions and their pain points that they go through to to achieve that intention. Right. And that that could be digital. That could be physical. Um, it could be in a store. Right. Uh, all of this stuff is really just about um, helping uh, a user go and seamlessly achieve their objective. Huli and Eric, I really like those definitions about what design is and what UX designers do. And now I want to ask my second big picture question. Why is design so important? You both started to address this in your definition. 
but I'd like you to share explicitly your views on the many ways design is important. The example I think speaks really well to the power of design comes from a project I had the opportunity to work on with Austin Smart City Alliance. And we were charged with helping people who are trying to find affordable housing in Austin. And that's a that's a nationwide problem, of course. But I started by going as if I were that user looking for affordable housing and discovered that I was going to have to take two buses from my home to an office completely on the other side of town. And when I got there, the resources they gave to me were on paper and they weren't in any particular order. If I needed to know whether there was an apartment available in a particular unit, I would have to call the landlord. And if there were uh, something painful in my hat, past I had to disclose like utility debt, I would have to disclose that over and over and over again in those phone calls. And it was clearly a painful, slow process for people who are already under stress. And what we discovered through partnering with the city of Austin and Code for America and a number of talented community members is we were able to build a solution that was digital, where a person could take a little quiz, say what they were looking for, what school district they wanted to be in, how close to a particular bus stop they wanted to be, and then pull up a map that showed where there were affordable housing units available in that area. Not ones that we could close, call and see if we're open or closed, but that were definitely available. And there was a woman who was there with her husband and daughter and she took the quiz at our testing and she saw the map come up and she just kind of put her hands on her heart and said, this is a blessing. And that's, that's a really short version of the story. But if you have the opportunity in your life to do work, even just once in a while, that gets you to the point or some other human being can look at what you've created and say, thank you. This is a blessing. That is a great and beautiful testament to the power and importance of design. Thank you so much for sharing that. But Huli, let me stop you for a second. Isn't how a tech interface looks and how that interface is interpreted at least a part of the design? Doesn't the appearance factor into design to make sure that the user interprets well how to use the technology and what to do next? Well, usability absolutely is one of the key heuristics. And you are going to want to make sure that people can read the copy on your site. You're going to want to make sure that there's appropriate color contrast so they can see what's meant to be in the foreground and what's in the background. But all of that is really mechanics. A, a metaphor that I think might be helpful as you think about looking at a, a film that's been directed and looking at a stage play that's been directed. With a film that's being directed, the director can choose exactly what they want you to look at and nothing else is on the screen. They've got complete control. That's not how the world works. The world is much more like watching a stage play and the person in the audience can look anywhere they want. What a good director is doing is guiding their eye through lines on the stage, through blocking, through lighting, through sound design. Eric, does that sound like a useful metaphor to you? Yeah, yeah. And I I, I would say that, um, you know, kind of UX design is really, if you really kind of want to get granular about that definition, to me, it's about exactly what you're saying, for sure. But there's also this visual um, layer on top of that to say like, you know, um, exactly what you were saying, like, are we drawing people's eyes to the right uh, interface? Are we guiding them through? Does the visuals match um, what it is that you're trying to help people through or the, the, the branding and, you know, the, the company that, that you're designing for? So all of these things kind of factor into how a person feels when they interact with, with, um, with UX elements and design. Um, and I, I think that really just adds uh, a lot um, to whatever it is that you're, the experience that you're creating. 
And I think another another thing to really uh, that that's really important about what UX is is um, there's this common misperception that it's that what we do is easy and it's like oh just put a button there you know just put a button and everything will just work out right it's it's so simple right um, when you start to peel off the layers of complexity it's it's really challenging to kind of distill something into um, simplicity. Right. So a lot of what we do is hide complexity of whatever it is that you're trying to do and make it feel simple and easy. Right. If we've done our job right, um, people are like, oh, yeah, obviously, like that's that's obviously what what the output should be. Right. And to get there is the stuff that they don't see. Well, that kind of leads me into talking about how design is taken for granted. I mean, that's kind of a good thing. You know, we don't want people to really be thinking about the design because that means it's probably not good. Um, so since it's not as quantifiable to non-designers as like language, math, accuracy and charts and diagrams, how do you explain to people, companies and organizations the importance of design, of great design? How do you explain that it can be measured? That's a great question. I would say that uh, one of the best examples that is out there is a story that Jared Spool tells. He talks about a client that he was working with that was really frustrated with, um, with their site. Uh, the users were not enjoying it and they couldn't figure out what the problem was. It was a very simple form. It just had uh, email and password. The button said login and register. There was a link for forgot password. That was the only thing on the site. And what they discovered is it wasn't what was on the page that was necessarily the problem. It was where the page lived. And users would encounter it after they filled their shopping cart and they were ready to make a purchase and they picked the checkout button, but before they could actually enter the information. So they saw repeat customers would purchase faster. That was the idea. And they thought first-time purchasers won't mind creating an account. Well, you've seen over the years that the solution that, that Jared Spool came up with, which was simplifying the process uh, and adding a button that said, you do not need to create an account to make purchases. You can just click continue to proceed to check out. And then when you check out, you can create an account if you want to. That increase the number of customers closing purchases by 45%. That was an extra $15 million of revenue in the first month. So the first year, the site saw an extra $300 million from just that adjustment. So when we think about design, we often think about visual design first and foremost, but it also includes information architecture and site design. It includes whether the button says register or submit which is the right choice for that microcopy. It, it includes all the research that you did to find out where do these people usually shop and how much time do they usually spend on this page? And is our process taking three times as long as our competitor? There's so many pieces that come into where that button goes and why it's in the corner and why are the corners rounded instead of pointy. There's there's science behind every bit of it. And there's a dollar sign on the other side. Yeah, exactly. And and to build on what Huli was saying, um around even the rounded corners, there is some some uh inference that that humans make about pointy versus uh versus rounded, which is like rounded slightly is more welcoming and and pointy uh, is is a little bit more rigid and you know kind of uh, intimidating, um, and so even even just that little nuance, uh, you're you're kind of branching into you know psychology um, in in a really really interesting way, and that all goes back to just trying to understand the mindset of of your users, um, and and uh, again to to Huli's point about truancy and kind of these flows and patterns for for checkout. Um, you know, websites right now have really, really detailed analytics. So you can really understand where people are getting stuck or or just not completing a transaction. And so 
before it used to be this very abstract thing like oh we're not sure what design is actually doing you know how how that's helping the bottom line um, but now we can actually really understand what ux design actually does and the impact that it has on on the experience and and on the bottom line um, so I, I read a statistic recently that said for every dollar of investment in ux ten dollars come back to a company and so it's it's really it's really kind of gaining in prominence about how important ux is right it it also just kind of there's this idea of this left brain light right brain um, and where you know mathematical people might not really understand um, ux and the impact it has even when you have those statistics so you it uh, UX being a UX designer is sometimes about being a teacher, um, which which Huli I know is is amazing at. Um, but it, it, there's a lot of teachable moments to help people understand, um, you know, the pain points of our users, but also understand the importance of uh, of UX design. And and sometimes that really just comes down to testing and having research to, uh, and and uh, analytics to really back up you know, why you need to make the changes you need to make. Um, and it, it's it's really interesting and, and wonderful to actually see the, the industry change so much and the perception of design and the impact that it has on a company change. Um, I'm totally dating myself, but when I graduated uh, from undergrad, I graduated as a, as a graphic design uh, major because UX design didn't actually exist back then. And what I used to have to do was, uh, I was the make it look pretty guy, right? On on the powerpoints, and and all of the decision making that happened was was without me, right? Uh, everything that was decided, and then it was given to me to to make it look pretty, right? And and now it's kind of completely reversed, where the UX designer is involved right from the get go. It's that person that everyone looks to to say like, well, what do our users actually want? in this in this situation and and how how can we actually go out and do that that makes me think of my degree i got a business degree because i didn't know about ux or anything i i mean i went to college in 2012 and the only option for design was graphic design and i didn't really identify with that but i was also the person in my projects in college who would be the one to make it make sense make it flow make it look pretty I wish I had known that, you know, but colleges these days, I think, are getting these programs more and more. So it's it's exciting. Well, I have a question now as the only non-designer on this episode that I'm going to ask, not just of Huli and Eric, but also of my co-host, Mary. Now that we've covered the definition of UX design and its importance, what is really interesting to each of you three about UX design and specifically in designing for technologies, the software services and applications we use and the and the digital hardware products we use. What part of UX design for technologies fascinates each of you? The first thing that popped into my head was how it makes you feel. Um, we are constantly being influenced by our devices and the technology we work on or work with. Um, it influences our mood of the day or our mood for the hour. If something's really difficult to work through, it can really frustrate you and make whatever you're trying to do um, more frustrating than it should be. Or if it's a more seamless, beautiful experience, it can make your day faster. If you are trying to work through something that seems monotonous and kind of tedious, good design and tech can move that along really quickly and get you through your maybe work day or whatever it is faster which can improve your quality of life and just kind of how you feel. And that's definitely what I think is most interesting. Yeah, to 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 build on those points and th those are excellent points. It, um for for me it's uh you know kind of mentioning what you said which is there's definitely a propensity for people to overuse technology right now. Um and we've all heard about bad actors that um, you know, these dark, these ideas of dark patterns where we're, we're kind of making it extremely difficult to cancel a service or, or making you, 
uh, feel uh, like poor self-worth after after experiencing a, a, a social media platform. I, I think for me, you know, UX designers really have a responsibility to users to really um, make the experience pleasurable, but not at the cost of their, you know, their personal well-being. So it doesn't need to be a, a zero-sum game where it's it's just about like, well, how can we help our company and shareholders, but also help our users, right? It doesn't need to be a zero-sum game. Let's do the right thing and make some money um, because really that's why all of us are employed, right? Yeah, Eric kind of stole part of my idea, which was ethics. The, the ethical landscape is something that is maturing rapidly. And in fact, we've even changed the curriculum in the program I teach. We used to teach ethics toward the end of the session. Now we cover it in the first week. We open it open with ethics and talk about design principles and sustainable design. So I think that's a really exciting thing about UX in the field is, is it's making sure that things like honesty, transparency, trust, sustainability are built in from the beginning, not added in on the back end at additional cost and, and pushing the project over deadline and, you know, causing people to say, well, we'll, we'll skip that. We'll, we'll fix that. <laughs> Once they say, we'll fix it in post, you know, we'll, we'll get that in version two. The other thing that's so exciting to me about UX design right now and designing for tech is that you don't necessarily have to know how to code to get a job in tech. Tech needs all kinds of people, all kinds of creatives. And so if you're an excellent writer, if you are an excellent uh, person at, at talking to strangers and interviewing them and getting them to open up to you, if you are excellent at uh, keeping your mouth shut and watching somebody use an app and see if, see if they break it and where they break it, there is a place for you in tech. You don't necessarily have to know C++ or Pascal or COBOL or whatever the kids are doing these days, Ruby on Rails. You don't have to know that. It's great if you do, but there's a place for you if you're human and authentic and curious. There's a place for you to make sure the tech of the future is human scaled and human based. Yeah, I, I love that. I think um, I, I I often think about you know the the unicorn person that can do everything. Um, Many times when people try and learn a lot of uh, skill sets, they become almost like a spork as, a, <laughs> as opposed to a fork or a spoon. You're just, you're just lousy at both, right? Oh. Um, so, so really for, for tech, um, for tech companies that, that do have the resourcing to, to get people that have more T-shaped skills where you you know a little bit about a lot of stuff but you're really deep and skilled in a very particular area i found that those people um are are very sought after uh in the tech industry when it comes to ux i guess building off of skills and unicorns hiring people and all of the different roles in ux what about methodologies. What are some of the popular UX design methodologies and approaches that you're seeing right now? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this to, to the world, but um, they're all the same. If you can start, you can use the double diamond. If that framework works for you, you can use the Stanford D school model, which is five steps instead of four. You can use uh, the Nielsen Norman Group circle. Uh, you can use the IDO infinity symbol, but they all take you through the same path, which is starting with curiosity and talking to actual humans and making sure you're solving for the right problem before you start designing anything. Yeah, That is the most important thing that I've seen. And so... Yeah, different people have different preferences, but at the end of the day, the the principles remain that you start with humanity and you make sure you're solving the right problem. And uh, I think the other piece on the other end is being willing to throw stuff in the garbage, being willing to test it and go, oh, 
I am the only one on the planet who understood what that button was for. I need to go back and redesign that. Yeah, the, you you bring up a really really good point about you know the qualities of a UX designer, which is you need to be okay with being wrong a lot <laughs> and separating yourself from the work um, because uh, you know when you when you learn UX, you know you're very passionate about the work, you're excited to share it with the world, and a lot of the time, you know it's not it's not great right there's there's room for improvement right we'll do the glass half full kind of approach on this stuff and so really just not taking anything personally and viewing it as a as a as a method for uh improvement on the next round and and all of the things that huli just described are are what's called like user-centered design methodologies right where where it's really about understanding your user and uh, that's the first part about like empathizing with their pain points and what their what their intention is and really trying to separate yourself from your users as well right because many times you might be very interested in the same things that your users are but you personally are not your user and so i've i've seen that a lot where designers create flows and patterns and designs for themselves and forget about their users. So it's it's really easy pitfall to fall into. Um, but um, the methodologies that Huli was talking about really help um, a designer and a, and a team of people that are trying to solve problems, solve it the right way, right? And and um, we call it the, the double diamond because um, the methodology is very cyclical. When when you go and test at the end a design and it's not great or there's some room for improvement or you know whatever you go back and you start that process again so it's it's not really ux design is not about delivering a final product and then being like cool we're done right it's never I it wish. never it never <laughs> plays out that way right so there is a constant supply of 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 improvement um and adding features and you know all of that stuff like really optimizing the the flows there's always something to do and that's that's kind of exciting um for a person that um you know kind of is a perfectionist is that you never have to get it right you know as as you release Right. So there's something really interesting about that. Yeah, I definitely have been told I'm a perfectionist a lot of times, and I've had to let go of that in all of the different iterations and, and ways that you're, first of all, using the different methodologies, figuring out which one works best for you and, and which project, because it depends on the project as well, but also letting yourself fail and kind of maybe reframing the word fail or failure. It's not a negative thing. It's just a part of the process and the process is fun especially when it ends well so another question i have after i feel like after you're learning these methodologies and practices what type of technology for ux design are you seeing right now or is there one that you're excited about um is there a tool that you think will be more widely used uh, I'll jump in there and say, I mean, we'll need to timestamp this podcast, right? Because six months from now, these answers could be totally different. But right now, I would say what I'm seeing in most workplaces is Figma as a tool, because it's a it's a really collaborative tool that came of age right before the pandemic, and it was it was just perfectly timed. Uh, to be able to respond to teams that were working remotely, to be able to work simultaneously on a document. Um, it probably doesn't sound like much to people who use Google Docs or Google Spreadsheets, but for design, it was a real breakthrough for multiple people to be able to work on something at the same time and make changes in real time. So Figma right now is very popular. They've got uh, a tool as well called Fig Jam, which is even more deeply collaborative and is great for non-designers who you want to involve in your design conversations. There's a very low barrier to entry with it and it's colorful, it's simple, 
it's easy to use, and it's not nearly as intimidating as some of the other products you may have used as, as bunning graphic designers. Yeah, I can I can second that. I think Figma is a is a really great application in the sense that it's a cloud application. So um, you can access it from you can access your files from any um, device, right? A laptop, uh, a, even a phone, a tablet. Um, they also offer some really great online resources to get you up and running very quickly. And uh, they also offer a, a free version for for designers to to learn and and understand the app before they start to work for a company. So the barrier of entry is quite low on that um, versus uh, something like uh, XD, which is a uh, in the Adobe uh, family, right? Where you you have to pay for a subscription cost, even if you're a student, right? They're they're reduced, but it's not free. Um, I I also think uh, another thing here is that um, you know we're talking about uh, software resources right now, but I also think uh, something important to note about experienced designers is uh, that they have to go and experience things, right? That could be you know just using software. That could be using an elevator and and you know just thinking about why it's designed the way that it's designed, right? Uh, and looking at uh, nature. And and seeing the way that the you know plants grow and stuff like that, uh, I know that sounds very hippie, <laughs> but it, it's it's totally true. Uh, you know, go play video games, go to the movies, read articles, um, and read books that you don't think you'll life uh, you'll like. Uh, lead an interesting life. Um, all of those things kind of impact the designs that you you create. I think there's something really interesting about that. Eric is absolutely right. A tool that I've recently started using more often, and I could not be more delighted with the results, uh, is Lego. Uh, sometimes you just need to get away from the screen and not and use your hands for something other than a keyboard, for something other than the the. There's a distance right between between your brain. And the individual letters on the keyboard forming the words or forming the concepts, there, there's a long route there. And if you're working with your hands, moving something in three dimensions and, and coming up with metaphors and, and telling stories about it, it taps into a whole different set of skills that you have as a designer. I found that really valuable to balance out all the work that people do on, on a keyboard. It's funny, yeah. that, Huli. I'm sorry, Eric. I just have to jump right in. Through the pandemic and being a UX designer, I have also gone into floral design and growing my own flowers. And that has been tremendously helpful to step out and use my hands to design something else in the tangible world. In this, in, in that needs to come out. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> I did an exercise with uh, with my students this last cohort that I had them draw something, and uh, it was a chair. Said I want you to draw the most amazing chair, and they're like, oh, I can totally do that. And they threw the chair. I said, Great, one down. Now I would like you to create it with this cardstock and scissors and tape. And they're like, oh, you didn't tell me that before. So they tried to make it work. And then I said, excellent. And now you need to make it out of pipe cleaners. And we just we just kept going. And the designs, of course, they morphed because there were things that you could draw that they realized, oh, I can't actually make that out of paper. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I learned two things. One is how, how many new ideas you can shake loose if you force people to use different modalities even though they're still designing the same thing. And the other thing I discovered is how important people think beer is because almost every one of the designs had some kind of keg yeah. or refrigerator or tubing so that they wouldn't actually have to get up out of the chair for their refreshment. So That's funny. I, I learn as much teaching as I do, as my students do, I think. 
it it's kind of interesting like hearing this um you know kind of experience exercise and uh this this kind of bleeds into some of the interesting things that you might be asked um if you interview at a tech company um some of the time what they ask you isn't software related right um i've had uh i've gone on interviews at huge tech companies and they've asked me to to redesign a kitchen um for for people that are visually impaired like what would that look like right and and whiteboarding out ideas uh about uh about how i would approach solving that that problem right and and how i might go and tackle it so uh, a lot of the times UX isn't about the, the particular skills and software. It's really about how you, the, the process of how you go and tackle um, problems. And sometimes that can be away from a, from a screen. Y'all have mentioned the pandemic a couple of times. So I'm going to ask a very explicit question about the pandemic and design importance and trends. Have you seen any positive trends or implications due to the rush move that we all experienced during the pandemic to using tech interfaces even more? And have you seen any negatives from this relatively sudden transition in terms of UX design? Well, as, as a parent, uh, I can say that uh, our educators, uh, myself included, were not necessarily prepared to make that swift a change from the old model of standing in front of the classroom to the new model of sitting in front of a computer. Uh, but what I have seen is some extraordinary advances in how to engage with one another. I've seen uh, incredible growth in people getting comfortable with these new tools in record time. And that's been kind of inspiring to me too. We were, we were caught caught by surprise, all of us, uh, by having to make such a rapid shift, but the the adaptability of humans uh, to make that shift, I think, is far ahead of the adaptability of companies' um, ways to leverage it. Yeah, uh, and to, to build on that a little bit, I think a UX designer's you know, best friend is a is an in person workshop with a bunch of sticky notes, right? Um, you, <laughs> the you obviously couldn't do that during the pandemic, right? Uh, to to be there in person, so we had to rely on digital tools to try and simulate that. Um, and one of the things that we could use is is Miro or or Fig Jam. They have a digital uh, sticky note, um, and so. Um, I was very concerned about the ability to do my job effectively digitally, um, but it it ended up working out pretty good. Um, there was a there was a bunch of people at the company that I work for that were um, didn't think that you could do UX uh, remotely, um, and so there was always this push to to be in the office, right? Uh, because that's where UX is done, um, and I think the pandemic. Um, you know, one of the positive things that came out of it was that you can do a lot of jobs that were previously, you know, thought to be only in person. That perfectly leads into my next question, especially about companies and organizations using UX or adopting UX now that the pandemic has almost forced a lot of people to do. Um, what advice do you have for companies and organizations improving their UX? Um, what metrics do you think they should use to assess their effectiveness? I think one, this is just one trend that I'm seeing. It used to be that an important metric to, to check was uh, the number of clicks that it, that it took somebody. And, and the rule of thumb was the fewer clicks, the better. You know, you want people to get there in as straight a line as possible. And what, what curiously seems to have showed up during the pandemic, and I'll, I'll be interested to hear Eric's take on this, is it, it, some of us are wired to browse, right? Some of us are wired to, to rely on word of mouth. And so a straight line isn't necessarily the most satisfying line. It's not necessarily the most satisfying experience. Sometimes a, sat a satisfying experience on a website is going to 
the progressive disclosure where there's only a little bit of information shared with you, kind of a just-in-time model. You have just enough information on that screen and you click and you go to the next screen and you're only there for a few seconds, it's just enough, but it feels as though you're building momentum and you're having a richer experience. Um, and it, that's just curious to me that humans are, are fascinating and human behavior is really intriguing, um, but that's a change that I've seen that is not necessarily about strictly the number of clicks uh, to get to a certain place is how do you, what's the route? If it's a, if it's a scenic route, then it doesn't have to be a straight line. It could be really satisfying. Right. Yeah. To, to build on that, I think, and uh, to, to try and answer this as abstractly as possible, it really, it really depends on the intentionality of, of the app or the flow of what you're trying to do. Right. We've, we've designed applications where uh, expediency was was what we wanted and so it was about how little amount of time they spent in the app once they once they got into it um other times it's about it's it's really about what huli was talking about it's it's about exploring and kind of uh browsing and and just uh being uh you know feeling like you're part of a community and so really it's just it depends on what you're trying to do and what your user is trying to do, um, and your you know your key performance metrics have to be based on that. Um, and as as far as uh, tips for for companies and organizations, um, it you know for like we talked about this before, but you know uh, a mathematical mind might not understand the utility or the the function of a UX designer, uh, and they might think that you know with the with the current industry ux people are in a lot of demand and so the the compensation for for that particular function has gone up um and you might think it's overpriced but uh my my suggestion is to pay it um and and it will it will pay off in spades with that you know $1 invested equals $10 uh you know kind of to the bottom line um I just recently read an article in Ars Technica about how Citibank made a $50 million error due to bad UI and UX, uh, and they accidentally sent money to various creditors. Um, and the, a, a judge ruled that they didn't have a legal right to take the money back. Um, and it wasn't because it, it was it was simply because of the interface that the that Citibank was using for that particular um you know function and so really really that that kind of encapsulates what bad ux and ui can do and that that really hurts the bottom line of companies right eric that's a great and compelling example of the power of design from a company's perspective you all have done a great job in sharing your definitions of ux design your perspectives on why ux design is important in tech but not always understood by non-designers how design really is quantitative and measurable and not just subjective and about appearances. And hopefully now our listeners appreciate the importance of design and have a greater understanding. So our final question is this, if our listeners now want to go into UX design as you three did, so Mary, I'm bringing you back in, what is your top advice or recommendation for them? Uh, what advice would I give them? I would say, uh, Spend some time reflecting. What is it about this this conversation that sparked your imagination? Is it the idea that you get to create change in the world? Is it the opportunity to continually be in, improving a product and never having to get it exactly right because the door is always open for something new? Is it the opportunity to work hand in hand with a talented team of developers and people who do code and watch your ideas come to life? Do, do some self-reflecting first about why this is appealing to you, and that will help you find your entry point. Uh, but I would just reemphasize there is a place for everybody if you want to be part of making technology and digital tools more human scaled there's a place for you mary what's your parting advice for our listeners who might want to be ux designers 
I I really think the advice I'd give is what I'd give myself when I started, which has taken me some time to learn through trial and error, which is being easier on myself and being less of a perfectionist and reframing the way I think of failure. If you are really interested in being a UX designer, you're probably someone like us who's really curious and likes to make things better and likes designing things and creating things. Um, And you might also be a perfectionist and you might also be a little hard on yourself. Don't do those things. Try not to Um, learn from me and probably Eric and Huli that it's the process that matters. That's the most fun. And, and you just have to have fun with it and learn as you go and just keep trying. Eric, bring it home. What's your parting shot of advice for our listeners who might want to become UX designers? I I would say um, tools are important, but I would say fundamentals are are paramount. So really learning the fundamentals of UI, the 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 why, um, is is super important, right? The tools in our industry constantly change, uh, and so be prepared for that. But really understanding why you would you would do specific things is is super duper important. And finally, um, mentorship uh, is is a really, really important part of UX. Um, you don't uh, don't you don't have to go it alone, right? Um, there's a lot of uh, UX people that have transitioned into UX from other industries, and so they know how difficult and challenging it is to break into the you know into the field. So I would just say, don't be afraid to reach out to people on LinkedIn or, you know, myself included. Um, and, and you know, it's always, I'm always very happy to give people advice or, or feedback on their portfolio or, or direction on, on uh, what they should do next to break into the industry. Outstanding advice and insights, everyone. Thank you all so much for your time. I hope our listeners really appreciate your perspectives about the nature and importance of UX design and tech. And most importantly, I look forward to seeing all of you in person sometime soon. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thanks for listening to the Austin Forum Upload. You can listen to additional episodes and check out a schedule of our monthly in-person events at austinforum.org. The Upload is a production of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society, a nonprofit organization here in Austin, Texas.